live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want to give you a hypothetical scenario. You're a guy, you're relatively rich when it comes to your finances, but you don't look the best. On a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of attractiveness, you're somewhere around a 3. You're super interested in this girl, and it's not like you two don't know each other. You've never really interacted with her before, but you're both familiar with each other, because you're in the same field, or the same class, or the same school, or something along those lines. So you go ahead, and you ask her out, and not only does she reject you, but she emphatically rejects you, laughs in your face, and says that under no circumstances would she ever go out with you, because you're not her type at all. Does it sting that you got rejected so brutally, and that she was so mean about it? Of course! She could have gone about that in a much better and much more delicate way. But you move on. And then, three months later, she loses a ton of money, and she's in some serious debt. Maybe she has a gambling problem, or just a spending addiction or a drug problem. You name it, she's now tens of thousands of dollars in the hole. Remember that in this scenario, you're still the same exact guy that you were three months ago. You're well off financially, and your attractiveness is exactly the same. And I'm sure you can see where this is going. She comes up to you and asks you out. And your response? Oh, you're rejecting that completely because you have self-worth. And you know that she's only doing this to use you for your money. Well, why do I bring that long-winded and extremely detailed scenario up? Because amazingly enough, this has relevance to college football. Because the team you've been watching is the 2002 South Florida Bulls. And that year, that's exactly what happened to them at the Seattle Bowl. They were rejected by the bowl game. The bowl game got into some serious financial trouble. And they were hoping that USF was desperate enough. And they decided to reach back out to the school and make an offer that they couldn't refuse. Except this offer was so bad and so laughable that it was the exact opposite of that. It just made them look like idiots. Because this is the story behind the Seattle Bowl, the South Florida Bulls, and what has to be the craziest bowl scenario in the over 25 year history of USF football. Before I talk about the scenario in question, we need some context to understand what the original plan for the Seattle Bowl was, and how South Florida was playing that they were even being considered in the first place. The rise of South Florida's football team was quite remarkable when you really think about it. They only played their first season in 1997, and by 2001, they were 8-3. No, they didn't make a bowl game, but just the fact that this was even a possibility in their first season in Division 1 was amazing. And in 2002, not only were they picking up right where they left off, but they were in the middle of putting together a special season. Because in 2002, the Bulls had, without a doubt, their best season in the short history of the program at the time, setting a then-program record by winning nine games. And making matters more impressive was the fact that their two losses were against schools and power conferences that they were never even supposed to beat, losing on the road to an Arkansas team that made the SEC championship, an Oklahoma team that was ranked number two in the country at the time the game was played. South Florida went undefeated at home, and beat some solid opponents in the process, including a Northern Illinois team that finished tied for first in the West Division of the MAC, a North Texas team that won the Sun Belt and ended the season on a seven-game winning streak, including a win in the New Orleans Bowl, and a Southern Miss team that was one of the best in Conference USA, and qualified for the Houston Bowl. And it's not hard to see why USF was playing at the level that they were playing at, because both their offense and their defense were firing on all cylinders, with the offense ranking inside the top 30 of the country in points scored, and the defense ranking inside the top 20 in points allowed. They allowed an average of 18.5 points per game, and if you take out their two games against power conference competition in Arkansas and Oklahoma, they only allowed 14.5 points per game all season. Thanks to some incredibly smart quarterback play by Blackwell, who only threw three interceptions all season, and an extremely balanced receiving unit, where there wasn't a huge drop-off from guy to guy, 
as six players had at least 250 yards receiving on the season, South Florida, in their final season as an independent, before they were set to make the jump to Conference USA, was having a great season that surpassed everyone's wildest expectations. That was the good news. The bad news was that finding a bowl game to take them, despite their 9-2 record, was not easy. In 2002 terms, they were waiting for a moment like this, but quickly realized that they got it bad. Unfortunately, it's not hard to see why South Florida was a tough sell, especially at a time where attendance was a big deal, and minimum attendance criteria needed to be hit for a bowl to maintain its status on a year-to-year -year basis. You needed to get schools that had fan bases that traveled well, or had large alumni bases in that city. And outside of bowl games here at Tampa, good luck getting any bowl game to take South Florida when they didn't have to, since they were an independent with no automatic tie-in, and when their football team existed for six years and had been a D1 school for two. So of course the base was lacking a bit. Schools and other programs were advocating for the somewhat unknown bowls, with East Carolina head coach Steve Logan saying, South Florida is an upper echelon team. If they're in Conference USA this year, they may well win it. And Oklahoma head coach Bob Stoops saying, South Florida is a much better team than some of you guys wanted to write about way back when. We understood it. They're a good football team with a lot of good players. But it looked like it wasn't going to be enough, as Jim Levitt, the head coach of the Bulls, acknowledged that the possibility of playing in a bowl game was going to be relatively slim. As Levitt said, we're a long shot. I really haven't thought about it. I don't want to get people's hopes up. You can go 11-0 and not get a bowl as an independent. Now, even though they were a long shot by all accounts, that's not to say that they didn't try and campaign for themselves. They knew it was a tough sell, but they weren't going down without a fight. They were fighting to get a spot in a bowl game and even tried to get an invite to the Motor City Bowl up in Detroit once it was determined that they needed an at-large team, since the Big Ten didn't have enough bowl-eligible teams. Head coach Jim Levitt said on that, Maybe I should run naked through the streets of Tampa with a sign that says we need to go to a bowl. I don't know what else to do. If I need to do that, then I'll do it. I'll probably get arrested. If we don't get a bowl, it's the biggest hoax in the country. If it doesn't happen... It's an absolute joke. And athletic director Leroy Selman gave the bowl a call, with Don Loading, a representative for the bowl game, saying that South Florida was under consideration for a spot. However, nothing materialized, as the at-large invite went to Boston College instead. Time to pivot to another bowl game, which in this case was the Seattle Bowl. And the Seattle Bowl needed an at-large team to face off against Wake Forest out of the ACC. At the start of the year, they signed an agreement to take the number 3 or number 4 team out of the Mountain West Conference, and turned down a deal with the Pac-10 to have them send their 6th place team to the game. The only problem? Yeah, the Mountain West was kind of terrible in 2002, and they didn't have enough bowl-eligible teams, as Colorado State, New Mexico, and Air Force, all of whom got invited to bigger and better bowls, were the only three teams eligible. The stars seem to align. South Florida needs a bowl bin. The Seattle Bowl needs a team to get. What about getting the Bulls to play the Demon Deacons in the game? Yeah, absolutely not. Because not only did the Seattle Bowl emphatically reject South Florida, but they burned every bridge in the book. They didn't turn them down easy, and said that they were considering it because they were a great team, but decided to go in a different direction. Their executive director... Jim Haw, flat out said, and I quote, There are no scenarios that we would take USF. We don't want two East Coast teams. You heard that, people? No scenarios. No circumstances. Nothing out there would lend us to taking the Bulls. So you'd think that would be the end of the story, right? South Florida gets rejected by the Seattle Bowl, which was just about their only chance left to go bowling as an independent. The bowl game goes in a different direction, and that's it. Except, that's where the story takes a bizarre turn. Because you see, the Seattle Bowl, in its second year of operation, was not exactly a stable bowl game when it came to their finances. It was kind of in shambles, 
and never really found its footing after moving from Hawaii after the 2000 edition. Every bowl has to submit a letter of credit to the NCAA. This is usually not a problem for most bowl games, except that the Seattle Bowl was not like most bowl games, as they missed not one, but two previous deadlines. Three strikes, and you're out. They needed to mail a check for $1.5 million and have it at the NCAA headquarters in Indianapolis by 2 o'clock on Friday, December 6th. The check was received at 1 o'clock. The bowl game was on serious ice, and was in danger of not being played roughly three weeks before it was set to kick off. And that's when the Seattle Bowl had an idea to try and get the money. Remember how there was no scenario where the bowl would take South Florida? Well, thanks to their horrible financial situation and their shambolic state of affairs, as it turned out, there was one scenario. You know how bowl games pay teams to come play there, and they'll give payouts for making the trip? What if the inverse happened, and South Florida paid the Seattle Bowl for the privilege of playing in their game? For the low, low price of $2 million, you can have everything you wanted and play in the Seattle Bowl. That's right. You get us out of the red, and we'll let you play in our game. I mean, you understand how absurd this deal is, right? It's already tough enough as it is for teams playing low-level bowls to make money, or even come close to turning a profit. They have to buy up a certain number of tickets. They have to travel not just with the team and the coaching staff, but with equipment, cheerleaders, and a marching band. They have to pay out bonuses to their staff. They have to advertise the game. They have to book hotels. They've got to do everything. For a football team that was just starting out, that wasn't exactly loaded financially, seeing as they played guarantee games as the visiting team, where they were getting money specifically to finance other sports and their operations, why would they do this? Why would they travel all across the country from Tampa to Seattle, spend a ton of money, well upwards of six figures on hotels and travel and all the other expenses, and spend an additional $2 million that's just going to the Seattle Bowl for no other reason other than the fact that the bowl is financially incompetent, especially when the other team, Wake Forest, doesn't have to pay a dime. I know South Florida wanted to go to a bowl game, but come on. They weren't that desperate that they were willing to financially destroy themselves for the opportunity. And remember, this was after the Seattle Bowl emphatically rejected them, metaphorically spat in their faces, and said that under no circumstances would they ever consider taking the bowls. And now that the tables have turned, and it's the Seattle Bowl that needs South Florida, and not vice versa like it was before, their stance changed, and they were going to act as though that never happened, and as though they never made those comments? Fat chance. Especially since there were some absolutely ridiculous strings attached to this invite. This is like when the school bully picks on you for your family being poor. And then, you're not just not poor anymore, either due to your parent getting a promotion, or your family winning the lottery, or inheriting a ton of money from somewhere, but your family is now richer than his. And immediately, the bully does a 180 and wants to be your friend now. No way, Jose. And as Athletic Director Leroy Selman said about the entire bowl process, I've never experienced as much volatility as I did with pursuing a bowl bid. It was a unique situation for me. This year happened to be one of the more complicated years. Safe to say, in an absolutely terrible trade offer, South Florida wholeheartedly rejected the deal. They never thought about it for one second. The Bulls sat out of postseason play, while the Seattle Bowl went on, with Oregon as the replacement team, and to the surprise of no one, there was never another Seattle Bowl played after 2002 due to financial troubles. I know, absolutely shocking. At least South Florida got a chance over the years to play in plenty of bowl games, such as the Sun Bowl and the Birmingham Bowl. And at one point in 2007, actually looking likely to play in the BCS National Championship, as absurd as that sounds. But at least in 2002, they would not be going bowling. Their first bowl appearance ever would have to wait. Because the idea of playing in the Seattle Bowl and the possible exposure from that was not worth having to financially destroy themselves and destroy their dignity in the process. 
Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.